how some of these people could get together and turn their backs against the temple and against the law of the old covenant and against the whole Judaism that he had known in the past. And so he committed himself to fighting it to the very end. And the passage we are studying today marks a change in his life. A change in Jerusalem. A change in the whole of the Jewish religion. And a change even for the church of the living God. And as we are here today, Paul the Apostle is gone. But all this is written for us so that you, by the grace of God, will learn and God will raise you up another hero for the church today in Jesus' name. Why don't you look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 1. And Saul yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem that's the beginning of the story as I've told you it's a unique chapter talking about a unique personality talking about a unique, a unique experience he was such a persecutor he became yet the greatest promoter and the greatest announcer and preacher of the gospel he had once persecuted. He had many advantages to his time. Number one, by birth, he was a Jew. And there were special things for the dispensation of the Jews. By citizenship, he was a Roman. History tells us that his father was a Roman citizen. Because of that, he was born also to have that Roman citizenship, all that came to help him in later years. By education, he was a Greek. By religion, a Pharisee of the strictest type of religion, the Pharisaic religion. And he said he was perfect in the obedience of the law of Moses. By conversion, he became a Christian, which is what we are going to look at today. It tells us very clearly that being a Christian is not just being active in religion. Being a Christian is not just to pick up some laws in the Bible and try to obey. Being a Christian is not that I'm doing my best. He was doing his best for religion. But he knew Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. But this chapter tells us how he met the Lord. How the Lord confronted him. How he encountered the Lord. And then a change, a transformation took place in his life. He was the one that said, eventually, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It is that newness of creature that determines who a Christian is. It's that change of life, change of heart, change of mind, change of direction in life, and change of livelihood. That's what determines who a Christian is. And by the grace of God, the son of Tarsus became a Christian by conversion. Notice those words becoming a Christian by conversion. We don't become Christians by church attendance. We don't become Christians by reading the Bible so many times. Go to read the Bible, but that alone in itself will not make us Christians. We don't become Christians by being born of Christian parents. It's wonderful when we're born by Christian parents that gives us quite a lot of advantages, but we become Christians only one way by conversion and that is how Paul the Apostle saw of Jesus. that's how he became a Christian and then by calling he was an apostle an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ he became so changed and so transformed he became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ a disciple of Christ and eventually became an evangelist a teacher, a preacher, a pastor, a missionary, a prophet, an apostle, a leader, a theologian, a defender of the faith that was destroyed, the faith was delivered unto the saints. He now defended that truth with the very life to the very end of his life. There was never a man like Paul the Apostle. There has never been since his time another man like Paul the Apostle. We, by the grace of God, as we study his life, 
and he himself said, follow me as I follow Christ, will endeavor by his grace and his strength, will endeavor by the anointing and the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon our lives to be the best we can be. And God can lay hold of your own life and turn you around. That you'll make a mark in your generation as a brother, as a sister. You'll make a change and you'll make a mark in your own generation in Jesus' name. The dramatic story of Saul's conversion and commission is recorded for us in this chapter. In fact, you'll find as you read the Acts of the Apostles, it's repeated three times over. Here in Acts chapter 9, then in chapter 22, then in chapter 26. It must be mightily important, mightily essential for us to know about the conversion so that we can learn all we can learn about the conversion of Paul the Apostle that is repeated three times over. And as we look at this, it was uh, the Bible reveals and himself says it too that it was a bloodthirsty persecutor breathing out threatness and slaughter against the church of the living God. The thought of Christians irritated him ignited something within him and excited rage and violent anger and fury it was like any time he heard the name christian disciples of the lord jesus christ he brought an irresistible desire to destroy and smash and crush everything is the god letters from this chapter we're reading is god letters of authority from the high priest what did he have to have a letter of um, authority from the high priest because, you know, at that time, the children of Israel as a nation, they were under a foreign rule. And so they didn't have the privilege of just arresting anybody and doing whatever they wanted. And they needed letters of authority. The high priest had been given the permission. In the case of religion, anything related to religion, they could deal with that. But Paul was still needed that letter of authority from the high priest so that anybody he found, he couldn't deal with them directly. He'll bring them to Jerusalem where they will be dealt with so that they'll be arrested, they'll be bound, they'll be imprisoned, whether they were men or women. He was going to Damascus. That was his aim. Damascus was uh, a quiet and ancient city. In fact, it's called the heathen of the ancient world. Why? Because that, time, that uh, Damascus had been there, if you read your Bible very well, from Genesis chapter 14, it actually says that uh, Abraham had servants from Damascus. And when you think about that, that means that uh, Damascus predated uh, Abraham. A city that had been raised up before Abraham, that was a great ancient city. And we're told of the layout of the streets and the houses, a very beautiful city. And now we have some settlement of Jewish people there. And many of these Jews are turned on to become Christians by those who are sent away or scattered abroad from Jerusalem. And he heard about and said, I'm going to go over and after those people. I'm going to arrest them and bind them and do whatever I can do. That Christianity must not remain. There's something here that surprises a Bible reader, a Bible student. It is this. As we go from Jerusalem to Damascus, a period, a distance of about 20 miles, you will go through the city of Samaria. And there was a great revival in Samaria. We read about that in chapter 8. Thousands and thousands of people were born again, rejoicing in their newfound faith, born again, and converted, committed to the Lord. And yet, Paul the Apostle did not find, did not find it necessary to branch there and to stop there and to arrest the Christians there. Why? They were young Christians and God protected them. And you young Christians, I pray the protection of the Lord will be upon your life in Jesus' name. We don't have to fear anything. If I become a Christian, this will happen, that will happen. God will moderate everything. You'll be able to bear everything that comes your way in Jesus' name. Now as a journey, the Lord Jesus confronted him. And with this divine encounter, he became convicted. Then he became converted. Notice those what He was convicted first, and then he was converted. Before conversion takes place, you will recognize you've been a sinner. There'll be conviction. You'll be sorrowful for sin. 
you will realize the depth and the height, the length and the breadth of the consequence of your sin. It's not just that I raised up my hand, I came forward, I received the Lord. It is one thing for you to receive the Lord, it's another thing for the Lord to receive you. He receives the people who have been convicted of their sins. And they felt so sorry that they have to leave all those things behind. And now they want to serve the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, and all their minds. That's what happened to him. First conviction and then conversion. And the course of his life was changed immediately. An account of the gospel proclamation was changed for the better in the land of Israel. And then even in the world and even until we, where we are today. Look at the end of uh, the passage we're looking at today, chapter 9 and verse 31, for you to see the immediate effect of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and for you to see the immediate effect on the church in Jerusalem and the church in the land at that time, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, then at the church's rest throughout all Judea. That is then, after his conversion, after his turning around, after he's, after he's giving his life to the Lord. And then after that, persecutor had been arrested and convicted and converted. And a mighty change had taken place now. The change did not only affect him, it affected the whole church. Then at the church's rest, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the commandment, in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. I pray that the study of today, as we look at the life of this great apostle, I pray this study will affect your life. Will influence you positively in the wrong, in the right direction in Jesus' name. As we pick this story, we're going to break the story down to three parts. Number one, the sudden conversion of an uncommon adversary. An adversary is an enemy. An adversary is an opposer. An adversary is somebody who is against and contrary to every good thing you stand for. And every good thing that Jesus stood for, every good thing that Calvary stood for, every good thing that Christianity stood for, every good thing that the church stood for, this man was opposed to it. He was an adversary. And it was not just a regular adversary like uh, every dick and Harry. It was not just a mild adversary. It was a zealous adversary his zealous enemy, an uncommon enemy, and then all of a sudden, because with our God, all things are possible. I said with God, all things are possible. Nobody is so difficult and nobody is so hardened and so, nobody is so simple that the Lord cannot arrest. And if you are there, you have not given your life to the Lord and you say, I want to be saved. I want to be converted. But my heart is so hard and my way is so tough and my habit is so set that I don't think I can ever change. Let me give you the information that Paul the Apostle I was harder than you could ever have been. And yet he was converted. That same God that arrested that man and converted that man and changed that man and turned him to be a profitable son in the kingdom, he will arrest you. And he will turn you to himself for the better in Jesus' name. Number one, then, the sudden conversion of an uncommon adversary. Number two, the supreme commission of an unconquerable ambassador. He himself later said, we are ambassadors for Christ and we stand in the stead of Christ and we're saying, we're pleading with you, be ye reconciled unto God. When the Lord called him, he wasn't just an ordinary Christian. You, you see there are some people that are a Christian, I'm a Christian. We can't find the effect of the call and the conversion in their lives. They, they are not doing anything to show that now they are soul winners for Christ, they are witnesses for Christ, and they are preachers for Christ, ambassadors for Christ. But this man Saul of Tarsus, when he came to the Lord, he became an ambassador, and he was an unconquerable ambassador because opposition rose up against him, even from that same Damascus. And then persecution and trials and temptations, everything, he withstood everything, was able to stand. The grace of God was so sufficient for him. The grace of God is sufficient for you. Point number three, the spectacular commitment. That man had commitment. His whole heart was in the call. His whole heart was in the commission. His whole mind, everything is God, his skill, everything is God. He put into the work. The Lord had given him 
they, 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 this is a spectacular commitment of an uncompromising apostle. Uncompromising apostle. There had been apostles before him, but even when those apostles before him took any wrong step, he rebuked them and stood for the truth. Uncompromising apostle. And that same spirit of an uncompromising a, a Christian, the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus' name. We we'll come to number one now, the sudden conversion of an uncommon adversary. I'm coming back to chapter 9, verse 1 again. I want you to have a feel of, uh, you know, what was in this man's heart. The purpose of his life. The passion of his life. The goal of his life. The things he did and how he did it. It was not anything he did. He did with all his heart. And so, yet breathing out threatenings. The word yet means that he's done it before. You know, at the time of uh, the, the death or martyr, martyrdom of Stephen, he was holding the clothes of those people. And he said, he gave his voice, his vote to the people that were stoning Stephen. And he says, yet, it's not stopped. Then in chapter 8, he went everywhere and went into the houses and he got men and women, anyone calling the name of Jesus, he got them out of those houses, he must persecute them. And he had not stopped, was yet breathing, uh, threatening and slaughter. How do you understand that? That is, he's breathing in and out, in and out. That's the very source of life. That's the very reason why we're living. Without breathing in and out, we can't live. And the Bible is using this language to make us understand that this is what he lived for. He was breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out. He was out and out and in and in and out, just laying hands on those people that were Christians. And what came out of him was threatening and, and then slaughtered against the disciples of the Lord. And then we're told he went unto the high priest. He was always imagining what next step will I take. And then he was to it says and desired letters, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the, uh, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, you understand that language? If he found any of this way, they called Christianity this way. Why? Because Jesus has said, I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life. And so because Jesus is the way to salvation, is the way to God, is the way to heaven, is the way of truth, is the way of holiness. Therefore, Christianity was known as the way. And he himself said, I'm persecuting the way. He didn't understand the full implication of what he was doing. If he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, it was even, it was not even tender for, you know, for the tender gender, for the, for the women that were normally tender. He didn't care. Even people cried. They were sorrowful. He, he wanted to crush it. If you were strong enough to be a Christian, then you must be able to bear the persecution he was going to give. That's the way he thought that he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. A light from heaven. Isn't that what you need that will bring a change to your life? A light from heaven. He had been in darkness all his life. He thought he was doing well. He thought he was in religion. He thought, I'm doing good. I'm doing the best I can to pay my way to heaven. You'll never pay the price. You'll never be able to pay the price or to get you to heaven. You'll never be able to, to, to gather together all the zeal you need, all the attention, everything you need to be able to get to heaven. There are religious people in the religious denominations. And they think that in those denominations will do this and do that. They will be able to get to heaven. Impossible. Impossible. It takes the light from heaven. It takes the light of the gospel. It takes the light from Calvary to bring us into the kingdom. And I pray that when that light shines, it will brighten your heart and brighten your life in Jesus' name. And the darkness of ignorance and the darkness of religion and the darkness of self-righteousness will get away from your heart and your life in Jesus' name. We're told the light shone from heaven, and then he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
I, as you listen to, you know, Jesus says, Saul, Saul. In fact, anytime Jesus called like that, Saul, Saul, was about to utter a rebuke. Master, Master, about to give her a rebuke. You are combined and you are occupied about many things. Simon, Simon. Again, the Lord was going to issue a word of warning. And here he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? As you think about that, he must have been thinking, I mean, I've never met you. I've never persecuted you. I'm just persecuting these people that follow the way. The people that say they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't this uh, telling us that Jesus is the head and we are members of the body of Christ? And what we do to the members of the body, we're doing to the head. That's what Jesus said. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? He knew that that voice was coming from heaven. And whoever is there talking from heaven must be the Lord. That's why he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. I thought he was dead. I thought these people that said Jesus is risen, I thought they were telling lies. I thought Jesus is no more alive. That's why I've been running after them. Now he's telling me that he is Jesus, he's still alive. I can hear his voice. All that immediately changed everything. Just one sentence. I am Jesus. What does that mean? I'm that Jesus born of Virgin Mary. I'm Jesus that is to save all the people from their sins. I'm the Jesus that the Old Testament prophets wrote about. I am the Jesus that died on the cross of Calvary. I am the Jesus that presents my blood for the cleansing, for the conversion, for the forgiveness of humanity. I am the Jesus that the only way to get to heaven. I am the Jesus that Moses, you say, you are worshiping, spoke about. I am the Jesus that all the, all the sacrifices of the Old Testament pointed to. I am the Jesus, your only hope and your only way to salvation. I am Jesus. It is hard for thee to kick against the priest. And he in verse 6, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, he, he knew not that he's Jesus, but he now accepted him as Lord. You are the Lord of my life now. You are the authority of my life now, he said. You see, he came to the point where now he recognized that Jesus is the Savior. And Jesus is the Lord. Can I tell you something? You're coming to the Bible, so you must get you to the point where you recognize Jesus is my Savior. If the Bible study is only to stop your head with knowledge and, you know, give you some verses, and then you can repeat some verses and have all these outlines at home and say, I've been to the Bible study, so that has not done anything. It is when the study of the Bible gets you to the point you're able to say, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. With trembling heart, with humility, you bend the knee before the Lord. You say, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus is my Savior. He is the Lamb of God that not only took away the sins of the world, that took away my sin. And the Spirit of God bearing witness with your heart that you are now a child of God, a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, a transformed Christian, a transformed personality. You can say, I'm now in Christ. I'm a new creature in Christ. He's done something in me. I know it. I feel it. I sense it. And I see the change he has made in me. It is then you're coming to the Bible study, you're coming to the church, prophets you at all. He now called him Lord and said, and he said, what will you have me to do? I don't want to follow my own will anymore. What do you want me to do? I don't want to follow my own way anymore. There's a way that seems right unto a man. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. I've seen that the way I'm following is the way of death. I now want to follow you. What will you have me to do? And then Jesus said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. He became born again. I said he became born again. And then he spoke about that some years later. Look at First Timothy and see how he spoke about his conversion. How the Lord arrested him. How the Lord took him from where he was to where he ought to be. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. It says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our Lord. It's no more just their Lord. It's no more just that 
the people in Jerusalem are worshipping him. I don't know why they're worshiping, wanting to pursue them. He says, it's my Lord to you. I thank Jesus Christ, Jesus our Lord, who has, um, who has enabled me in that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before? He's not going to repeat it again. This is what I was. But thank God, things are different now. Something happened to me. A conviction came upon him. A conversion happened within him. And a consecration also took over his life. You see, when, if you really belong to the Lord, it will not just be that I'm a member of Deeper Life. I was born in Deeper Life. And I've been associated with Deeper Life Bible Church for a long time. It's not association. It's conversion. There is conviction first. You know that you are a sinner. You feel terrible, you've been a sinner. You feel sorrowful, you've been a sinner. And you have the sense that if I continue in this direction, this is going to end in hellfire. And because of that, you're not the, con the conviction to lead you to conversion. You surrender your life completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after that conversion, you commit yourself, consecrate yourself, surrender yourself, devote yourself completely to the Lord. He said, he says in verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. And I obtained, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't believe that Jesus was the Savior. And because of my ignorance about who Jesus was and what he came to do, that's why I did that. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Tell me the rest of whom I am chief. You know, nobody could have told him that. He thought it was righteous, self-righteousness. But the Bible says all our self-righteousness, everything you've done before you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, all our self-righteousness, they feel the wrath. He realized that. And he said, I was the chief of sinners, but now I am saved. Saul pursued the persecution of Christians before he was born again in Jerusalem, zealously and without relenting. His goal was to root out Christianity from every city in the land, in the nation. Having received letters of authority to bring Christians bound to Jerusalem, he was journeying to Damascus. And the Lord was gracious. The Lord was gracious. And the grace of the Lord is still available for every one of us today. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. If you come to the Lord, that grace will be a poured upon your life in Jesus' name. That's the marvelous, infinite, matchless grace that is freely bestowed upon the chief of sinners, upon everyone. Is a grace that exceeds all and sin that is calling you come. You don't have to die in your sin. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And can, can you think of the possibilities of what could have happened to Saul? Because there have been other people like Saul that had persecuted the people of God before. We know what God did for you to understand that this was grace beyond measure. Number one, the Lord could have removed the wheels of his chariot. He did that for Pharaoh and all his chariots when they were in the Red Sea. Number two, the Lord could have rained hail some fire on him. He did that for the Egyptians. You remember in the land of Egypt when Moses was before them and the hills were still there. The fire was still the fire was still there. He could have rained all that on Saul, and or the Lord could have opened the ground like he did for Koran, the death and Abiram, to swallow him up alive. That you'll find in Numbers chapter 16. Or the Lord could have dried up the hands or the limbs of this man. Man. What he did to that king that said, take him, wanted to take hold of the prophet that came to rebuke him for his sin, to rebuke the idolatry. And the Lord could have done that, but the Lord did not do that. Instead of the Lord drying up his hands or his name, the Lord converted him. The Lord changed him. I pray that that same grace will be made available for every one of us in Jesus' name. And the Lord could have, the Lord could have uh, smitten him with an angel. An angel could have come from heaven, like an angel struck uh, that herald and he died immediately. Or could have turned him to an senseless animal, 
like he did to Nebuchadnezzar. But instead of all that, the Lord just confronted him and convicted and brought him to repentance and to submission to the divine will. This is grace. And I pray that that same grace will be available to every one of us and then we'll take hold of that grace in our lives in Jesus' name. You remember Haman in the Old Testament? That's the Haman that wanted to destroy all the Jews. The Lord uh, made sure it was hung on the gallows that he had for Mordecai. And the Lord could have done that to Saul, but he did not. He made him to have the grace. The Lord called him, but there is something on the side of Saul himself. Immediately he had the call of God, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you going the opposite direction to me? Why are you contrary to grace and contrary to righteousness and contrary to Calvary and contrary to the way that leads to heaven? Why are you persecuting me? Immediately he surrendered. Look at his testimony in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And I'm reading here from verse, reading here from verse 15. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. He said, that's the only thing that could have called me. If it were by merit, I should have died. If it were by merit, I should have been forever lost. If it were by merit, he should have thrown me to the depths of hell. And you need to realize the same thing in your life. There's nothing you merit except judgment. There's nothing you merit except death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's your marriage. There's nothing you merit except eternal lake of fire in hell. That's all we merit, all that we have done. But he said, instead of giving me what I merit, he has granted me grace, he said, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with what? With flesh and blood. What does that mean? I compared not with flesh and blood. He said, the people who are like flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, I did not confer with them. I did not say, what do you think about this? I'm hearing the call of Christ. I'm hearing the call to become converted. Don't you know there were people traveling around with him when he was going to Damascus? There were people that traveled with him. He didn't go to ask flesh and blood. What do you think about this? Can you hear the voice I'm hearing? Can you see the light I've seen? Can you see how the mighty power of God just threw us down from the chariots where we were riding? And this voice is calling me, should I yield or not? There are many people that make mistakes when the Lord is calling them. The Lord is saying, turn away from your sin, turn away from your evil, and get away from that gang, and get away from that group, and come to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll make your life beautiful. He'll turn you around. He will do something in your life, and your life will have, you will have a kind of glow, a kind of shine. That, that you never thought about before, but they want to go to flesh and blood, to their friends, to their relatives, or to the people of the same blood and the same tribe of them. Should I, shouldn't I? Don't do that. The God is coming to you by yourself alone. Please respond to that and repent. He said, look at that again, verse 15, and say, but when it pleased God to who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately. I confide not for flesh and blood. To preach him. There are many people say they have been saved, born again. And a conviction is coming to them. If you say you are saved, tell other people. If you say you are saved, preach the gospel. If you say you are saved, let others know of this way that leads to heaven. They say, well, for me to stand up in the bus and preach, for me to stand up in the street corner and preach, for me to stand up early in the morning and then take the loudspeaker and be saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the only Savior. Turn away from your sin and turn to the Lord. For me to do that, I must ask my husband, I must ask my wife, I must ask my children, I must ask my neighbors whether this is befitting to me or not. He confirmed not with flesh and blood. As the Lord is calling upon us and he shows us what to do, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. 
and then let's look at uh, second corinthians chapter 5 a mighty king that came upon him in fact this man that was persecuting the christians before what he was persecuting then he now began to preach and that's how we know a person is born again anybody can say i'm born again anybody can say i'm converted anybody can say i'm a child of god shows the evidence we can we don't know your thoughts we don't know your experience Nobody knows what change has taken place in your heart. It is your action. Your action now, if they are different from what it was, then we say there's a change in this man. If your language is different today from what it was, we say there's a transformation in this woman. If your attitude, your disposition, the places you used to go, if you're not going there anymore, the clothes you used to wear, you're not wearing them anymore. The things you used to drink, you're not drinking that anymore. The things you used to eat, you're not eating them anymore. And the group, the gang, the evil company you are keeping before, you're not keeping that anymore. Then we can see, we can see that change. Whatever has happened inside you, that's your personal experience, but it is the outworking of that experience we can see. Then we'll say that this man is converted, this man is transformed, this man is changed, or this woman is converted and transformed and changed. Look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm asking you the question, can we see the change in your life? Can we see the change in your language can we see the change in your dressing can we see the change in the company you keep can we see the change in the way you spend your time the way you spend your money the way you spend your life can we see any change at all in second corinthians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 17 therefore if any man be in christ therefore if any man be in christ you know there are people that say well i'm not i'm not claiming to be righteous because i'm not in deeper life it's not a matter of being in deeper life if any man be in christ if you are truly converted you are truly born again anywhere you know paul was saul was not converted in the synagogue in a temple in deeper life assembly in a denomination it was on the road he met the lord and when he met the lord on the road that change was there anywhere you meet the lord in a house in a fellowship in an assembly in a church building in a crusade in a retreat anywhere if any man be in christ he is a new creature and it says old things have passed away behold all things have become new all things are god who has reconciled us to himself by jesus christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation he made the we ourselves are reconciled unto god and we have now the ministry of reconciliation you're not just say i'm born again and then you're not leading other people to be born again look at verse 19 he said to we that is to say that god was in christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation giving us a ministry like he gave Saul of Tarsus and then he said I did not confirm with flesh and blood I did not ask permission for my friends and my neighbors and my relatives and my family whether I'm to preach the gospel or not he said that's what God has told me to do and it must be done I pray that that independent attitude that freedom that liberty, liberation, that deliverance, that you know that this is the will of God and you will not need the permission of anybody to do the will of God. Are they greater than God? Are they competing with God? Are they competing with Christ in your life? Christ has said, this is the way. Walk ye therein. The grace to do that what you have in Jesus' name. And then other people will follow. They'll see your good example. They'll see that Jesus truly is your Savior and Jesus truly is your Lord. Then he says in verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. It happened uh, to him, it happened to the Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, this is a general thing. If you are really born again, we'll see the difference. It says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Here is Paul the apostle now in later years already has gone through this same process conviction, conversion, consecration. 
And now he's telling the other people to don't just come to church. Don't just say, I'm, I'm part of the Corinthian church. Let's see the conviction. Let's see the conversion. Let's see the consecration. It says, know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you know that? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor the abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You see that? It says that none of these people, if they continue that way until they die, if they continue that way, they don't have a Damascus Road experience. If they continue that way, there's no conviction. If they continue that way, I go to church, I feel all right. I go to church, I feel okay. I go to church and I'm doing all this and, and I, don't, I don't feel my conscience does not condemn me because you, are, you have not been convicted. That's why your conscience has not condemned you. But your pastoral conviction, this is bad. This is terrible. This leads to hellfire. This is against the way of the Lord. And then you say, who can save me from this body of death? And then you go to the Lord in prayer, Lord, I must be saved. I must be changed. I must be transformed. I must have my own Damascus Road experience. Then it says in verse 11, and such was some of you, but she are washed, but she are sanctified, but she are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Uh, I pray the Lord will affirm that in every soul in Jesus' name. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm reading here from verse 18. It tells us the means by which this is done. It tells us it is not our own self-righteousness. It's not our own trial. It's not our own struggle. I'm doing my best. I'm turning over a new leaf. That will not make it. That will not cut it. It is the blood of Jesus that washes and cleanses us, makes us whiter than snow. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1 verse 18, for as much as she know that she was not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, silver and gold, I contribute money in the church. That's great, that's great. But that doesn't bring conversion, that doesn't lead to heaven. Get born again first. It says, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the blood, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It happened to him, it will happen to us. We come to point number two now. As we come to point number two, we're looking at um, the Supreme Commission of an unconquerable ambassador. The Supreme Commission of an unconquerable ambassador. I want you to come back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. I'm reading now from verse 6 again. From verse 6, it says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, now he called him Lord, he accepted him as Lord, he received him as Lord, he submitted to him as Lord. There are some people, they say, well, Jesus is my Savior, but I'm still struggling with making him Lord. Think about that. Are you the one to make him Lord? He is Lord already. The Father has made him Lord and given him a name above every name. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. He is Lord. He told his disciples, you call me Master and Lord. You say, well, for so I am. He's ready, Lord. It's for you now to submit, to surrender, to consecrate, to yield unreservedly unto him. That you recognize he is Savior, you recognize he is Lord. And there's no part of your life that is uh, being lived outside his control, outside his sovereignty, outside his authority. You accept him, you know him, you submit to him as Lord. In verse 6, he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? When you look at that verse, Lord, have me. Lord, have me to do. Lord, what do you want me? What would you have me to do? Arise and go into the city, and it shall be it shall be told thee what thou must do, not what thou may do. 
all your own agenda push it to the side if you're really born again all your past aspirations ambition this is what i would like to be i like to be popular i like to be a politician that will arrest all these people and bring them back to Jerusalem. leave all that alone now what will you have me to do arise and go to damascus to show what you must do in verse 7 and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless hearing his voice but seeing no man and saw arose from the earth and when his eyes were opened, he saw, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. What's that? Not eating, not drinking. I said, what's that? Fasting. He fasted because he said, I want, already now he lost his sight. He couldn't see anymore because of that light that came from heaven. But he didn't say, uh, if this uh, new way, if it's good, why have I lost my sight? If this uh, new direction I'm to go is good, why this and why that? Already he said, it's my Lord. Let him do with me as he pleases him. And now he gave himself to prayer. All the people that traveled with him from, uh, from Jerusalem to Damascus, they only led him there. We're not told they joined him. We're not told they agreed with him. We're not told they were also born again. We're not told they were converted as well. Other people are looking for who is joining me, who is supporting me, who is helping me, who is encouraging me so that I can be in this Christian life, who is following up on me. When you are born again, you'll be the one seeking the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. When you're truly born again, it's not that somebody is running after you. Will you come to church? And no, I have my own church, your own church, your own religion of the past. That's, you know, Saul had his own church, he had his own assembly, he had his own religion, he had his own teacher, Gamaliel. But now he said, I forsook everything. And the Lord said, now to him, let me read to you now from verse, from verse 10. It says, and there, there was a certain, a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said, the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, behold, I am here, Lord. I am here, Lord. You see, all those Christians in the early church, they just received the Lord as their Lord. They submitted to the Lord as their Lord. And any time, any day, the Lord called them. There was no question. They obeyed the Lord implicitly. They obeyed the Lord promptly. They obeyed the Lord completely. They obeyed the Lord wholeheartedly, without any question. Immediately, God called the Ananas and said, Ananas, here am I, Lord. He called him Lord. And then he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. In verse 11, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called straight. This is what we call the word of knowledge. He was not an apostle, but just a disciple in Damascus. And the Lord revealed to him the name of Saul and the experience of Saul. And the place where Saul was, he knew that that's a word of knowledge. And that's what we say today, if you are born again, praise the Lord. If you are sanctified, praise the Lord. If you are filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost, praise the Lord. The Lord will reveal himself to you more and more. Definite knowledge coming from the Lord to tell you this is the way to go. This is what to, this is who to contact. And then we're told it's in the, in the street called Straight Inquire and in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. The Lord even to and asked what the man was doing. He was praying. You see, he was converted. What was he still praying? Born again already. What was he still praying? This shows you now that before and asked God there, this man was paying for deeper experiences in the Lord. He said, Lord, all this is new. I've submitted myself to you now. What will you have me to do? I don't know how great that assignment will be, how broad, extensive that assignment will be. But here I surrender everything. I surrender everything. I give up everything. Whatever it is you want in my life. It, one by one, it was laying everything down on the altar. That's what you call consecration. All those three days of not eating and not drinking and fasting and waiting before the Lord. He wasn't even praying for his eyes. He wasn't praying for material things. Oh Lord, I commit myself. I surrender myself. Lord, 
do something in me. He had read the Old Testament through and through before this time. He knew about sanctification. He knew about pure heart and clean hands. And he said, Lord, clean up my hand. Clean up my hand and cleanse everything. Sanctify me. That's what he was praying for at that time for all those uh, three days. And when you are truly born again, there will be a thirst to you. There will be a hunger in you. You want to know more of God. You want to go deeper in the Lord. You want to lay everything on the altar. You want the fire of the Holy Ghost to come and purify and sanctify your heart completely. You want to stretch yourself before and say, Lord, if there is any iota of self still remaining, take everything away. For all those three days, he will not talk to any man, any woman. He just, he was praying unto the Lord. And then we are told, and, and, and he has seen, look at verse 12, and he has seen in a vision that he see even saw now, he has begun to see visions. As seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him uh, that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how many evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. You see that? The Lord was saying us that this man is converted already. He is now not just an ordinary follower. He is a vessel. Not only that, he is a chosen vessel. Who is a chosen vessel? Somebody who is converted. Who is a chosen vessel? Somebody whose vessel is cleansed. Cleansed. Inwardly cleansed. Inwardly purified. Inwardly sanctified. I read it to you in the Bible uh, just now. That when we talk of a vessel unto honor that is going to be used of the Lord, it's not only that you are saved, you are also sanctified and purified. And that is what he had been praying for. Now we are told uh, that the Lord said that he just go your way. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, what did he say? Tell me out loud. But that's all. Was he born again? Was he saved? Before Ananias got there, was he converted already? Of course, yes. That's why Ananias, Ananias first of all complained. He said, Lord, this man you are sending me to is not a believer. This man you are sending me to is an injurious person. He's a persecutor. He even has letters of authority in his hand to lay hands on anybody calling upon you. And then the Lord said, it's a chosen person. And has understood that to mean that the man had been converted. Can the Lord bear testimony concerning you like that? That through and through, your heart, your soul, your mind, your brain, Every part of you, within and without, can the Lord bear testimony concerning you that you are a chosen vessel, that you are born again. He knows you through and through. He knows your life. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you are doing. He knows where you are now. He knows your intention, what you are still planning to do. Can the Lord knowing everything about you turn another person? He is converted. He is consecrated. He is sanctified. A chosen vessel. And so, and as God there and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it were as it had been scales, and he received the sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. There is healing still today. I said there's still is still today. You see, there was no apostle there, now, so just a disciple. And through you, a disciple of the Lord, if you're a real disciple indeed, the power of the name of Jesus, the power of healing, will walk through you as well in Jesus' name. In verse 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then Saul was certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. You see the thing that had happened? Let, let's see when he was called the chosen vessel. Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, what Jesus had said to the 12 disciples. He now had said concerning this Saul, concerning this Saul of Tarsus. We're looking at it. We're looking at chapter 15 
and this is um, John chapter 15. As we look at John chapter 15, we're looking at verse 16. He have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He is a chosen vessel. And ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. What the Lord had said concerning the twelve, the Lord said concerning Paul, that is a chosen vessel. Those twelve, the Lord said, you are chosen. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. And I have chosen you so that you will preach my word, you will do my will, you will bear fruit. And uh, we know that uh, Paul the Apostle... You have received the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, the General Superintendent of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you accept the whole world and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week, and the one we are going to listen to the next week by the power in the blood of Jesus Christ. If we tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. your emergency plan today. Hi, I'm Judy Bloom. You know, in today's economy, many libraries are being forced to do more with less. Shrinking budgets demand a lot of hard 